Well, let's put our hands together for the Lord. All right, one more time for the King of Kings. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Let's try it again one more time for the King of Kings. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm so overwhelmed and I'm so much excited this wonderful morning being able to be present with you here today and having waited for a very, very long time for such a time as this. And um, I'm so thankful to God. I would go to bed every night knowing that a few days to go I'm going to be interacting with the most important people, key people, people who are going to determine the future and even the present of this present age. I'm so glad to be a part of your life and I'm thankful to God for allowing me to participate in your growth and in your success. It's an honor. It's an honor. I'm not just here to teach you something, but I'm also here to learn something. Even as you teach, sometimes you get to learn. As you explain, you also get to understand. Um, I really want to appreciate men and, and women of God that have come all the way, traveled hundreds of uh, miles. And um, seeing you here today, it didn't start today. It took you even months to prepare so that we are together today. It's, I really would want to respect you and honor you for such a very much visible uh, interest that you have demonstrated in the things of God. Thank you so much, pastors, <laughs> ministers, those of you that are coming from outside of this country, I really want to salute you. You have really sacrificed a lot, not just money, but also time. Thank you, pastors. Thank you, men of God, women of God, for being here. I really appreciate that level of sacrifice. And also, uh, preachers, ministers that we have that are coming from inside of this country. Again, being here, it's a huge sacrifice. And I promise that I'm going to also do justice to that level of commitment that you've shown. <laughs> During this seminar. I'm so thankful to God for giving me a, a person in my life who of course, I, I don't want to say much now, maybe later, but I really want to appreciate my wife. Yes. The ministry wouldn't have been what it is today had it not been for this caliber of a woman. There's a lot that I can say, and I'm privileged by God's grace sometimes to be able to understand behaviors, 
and read abilities even if they are hidden so i can go on and on and on to an extent where by the end of this seminar you have understood hey, more than you understand yourselves so let me put that aside for now but i will keep coming back because she really has overwhelmed my entire being so i'll keep on coming back to her once in a while because she has been so good to me she has been so good so good so since we are here for information and impartations and transference of grace and so many things i i feel that the the time is finally come when information that um was supposed to be kept and reserved for probably another decade or so needs to be brought out and be given to people <laughs> who are ready to see better even improve the manifestations of god in their lives and you are going to realize that i'm going to be so much generous in the way that i distribute information and knowledge because i feel you deserve to hear even what has been kept for ages I don't want you to leave this place having had things that you already know because there are things that you have done things that you have tried and still there isn't any changes that you can see it means there is something else that needs to be done or there is a way that something needs to be done and we are going to have a very very wonderful time in the presence of the lord together sharing and i promise that i'm going to open up myself and show you things that i believe god wants you to see so that there is no excuse whatsoever there is no way that you can go back and continue ministering the same way that you used to minister before i know and i'm sure that changes are bound to happen So we are going to start today. You know usually the first day has its own challenges. But for the time that we still have before we get to lunch, let's attempt to look into this mysterious thing that we have always been hearing about which is the anointing. We start from there. and who also let our own get into other uh important topics that have been lined up for you but let's start with the anointing the anointing
so that we can at least appreciate what exactly the anointing is and what it does. What is it about the anointing that makes it so special? To an extent, to a point where almost all of us here, we have once asked the Lord for it. We have once prayed for an anointing. Not just once, several times, probably we have even fasted for an anointing. But as you know that sometimes we do pray for things that we don't understand. And even if we are to be given by God what we don't understand, still we are going to miss out on the functionality. Especially if it is the anointing that we have asked for and we don't know what it is and then it comes and we have it and then it begins to function in a way that we don't understand. We are never going to at any point appreciate God for giving it to us because we don't know what it is and we don't know how it operates. So it is important that we look at the anointing. What is the anointing? And then we'll look at how does it work? How is it that we have quite a number of men and women of God that have been anointed but they do not have the grace to explain how they got that anointing. And in most cases, if you, are, you try to put them on a tight corner, the simple answer they can give you is God's grace. Have you ever have you ever gotten closer to a man that is a wonder to you and you really want to know how, how do you do that? And he summarizes everything by letting you know that, you know. That is the grace of God. I'm that kind of a person who is not satisfied by that kind of an answer. I need details. Explain to me, if it is by God's grace, explain that grace of God. How does it work? How come you have it and I don't? I want to know. How is it that you are able? You allowed us to attempt deliverance and to set free this young man and you were away and we realized that it was deliberate you went away knowing that somebody was bringing his son who is afflicted by an evil spirit and the thing was actually arranged it was timed you allowed this man with a condition beyond our capacity to handle to arrive while you were busy praying in the mountain and you gave us all the time to try all methods and formulas. Until we were even ready for you to come. <laughs> Would have wanted to give it to you as a testimony of the things that we did while you were away. So that we can prove to you that even when you are away, we can still do some deliverances here and there. So until Jesus came back in a very, very beautiful manner, he managed to nicely set free that gentleman from an affliction that was there for years. Yes.
And after, when the session was over, they went to Jesus and they were now, they were so humble enough to ask him how come we could not set free this gentleman. In terms of voices, it was a combination. All of us were praying at the same time. So we can be talking of the sound system or the decibels or something like that. There must be something that you have that we don't. How come we could not, not I, we could not, all of us together having combined our different graces and it's a combination of different prayers and fastings that could not set free one man. How come? And then he raised a certain point. He began to explain. He did not say it is by God's grace because he is, he is God. He had to find something else. So it's always important when you have realized that there is somebody who can do something that you cannot do probably in a way that you can do it to always raise it up as a question and say, what is that? Explain that to me. And I'm so thankful to God that God is in this era giving us the ability to explain mysterious things. I, you know, there is nothing in fact, there is, there is a lot of things that are it's difficult. But, you know, it's so difficult. I, you can ask me, I can tell you today, it's so difficult. Being able to explain spiritual things, spiritual things are so hard to explain. Why? Because of the language required for the things of the spirit to be explained the language that is available so far for the things of the spirit to be explained the language is so difficult to learn and even if one of us is to sit and study and learn and understand the language that explains spiritual things the people also have to also attend the same school so that they are able to understand the language when it is being spoken that explains spiritual things. And when you come across a man who has a gift and the gift is accompanied by or with an ability to explain it, then you know that that gift is easily transferable. Amen. Let me repeat that. When you find you come across a man who has been given an unction, an ability to perform a particular assignment, he has it as a gift to function. And that gift alongside, when that gift is coupled with an ability to explain it, then you know that that gift is easily transferable. Many men and women of God can do exploits, but bring them to the table and say, just please, can you explain how do we also arrive at that result? Explain how it works. Explain to me how it is done. They leave that part to God. It's a mystery. It's a miracle, so you can't explain it. But when you are given a gift by God and you are given a language that can explain the gift, and the people around you are given grace to understand that language. It means that gift can easily be distributed at the level of information, at the level of communication. 
There is nothing that we do as men of God that cannot be explained. We have to be able to explain how we see what we see. We have to be able to explain how we heal the sick. We have to be able to explain how souls are won. We have to be able to explain how you can get the attention of the people. Because it's one of the miracles that has to be performed by you. Before you perform any other miracle, there is this particular... Okay, I'll get to that yes. later on. I'll get to that. It is difficult for people to sideline you when you have the anointing. It is difficult for people to act as though you are not there when you have the anointing. It's impossible for mankind to ignore the presence of an anointing. If you don't have people looking up to you, attracted to you, it's not just people that you don't have. There is something else that you don't have. An anointing, an anointing, an anointing. What is it to be anointed? What have you seen? Whenever I've heard some of you say, that woman is so much anointed, that man is anointed. What is it that you would have seen when you say a person is anointed? You have said it several times. Don't act as if you never. When you say that a person is anointed, what is it that you would have seen that you are referring to as an anointing? And we want to find out, is that really an anointing? Or it is something else? Lest you leave that place, you go, you pray, you fast for an anointing that is not even an anointing. And you get an anointing that is not an anointing. And you keep searching for what? For an anointing. What are the disadvantages of not knowing what an anointing is? It means you keep searching. To a point where you might actually be using an anointing to search for an anointing. <laughs> As you know, you know, the Bible talks about, because these are, it comes in different levels. The Bible talks about, okay, let me leave that one for now. We, we still have more days to go. Take it easy, take it easy, please, please. please. <laughs> you see, in the book of Acts of the Apostles, this was our theme at, at Bible College how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and how he went about doing good. And he was healing the sick for God was with him. Now, verse number 38 of chapter 10 of the book of Acts. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and and with power. And what did he do after that? Who went about doing good? 
he then went about after after so jesus himself knew the dangers of going about first before the anointing comes upon his life but for you to know that it is dangerous going out there without an anointing for you to know that you need a measure of an anointing you need an anointing to search and to find an anointing there is a measure of an anointing that you require in order for you to hunger for an anointing it is in fact it is that little measure of anointing that hungers for deeper levels deep calleth unto deep deep calleth unto deep deep calleth unto deep deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water sprouts so when deep calleth you must understand that the deep has an ability to call when the deep calls it is the deep that hears and it is the deep that responds to the deep the deep calleth unto deep when deep calls it is not shallow that responds when deep calls it calls unto deep these are like like pause like you were talking about so an anointing calls unto an anointing the hunger in you for an anointing is not your personal hunger it is the hunger of an anointing it is the deep in you calling unto the deep the you that we know cannot be so much obsessed with the things of the spirit it must be the thing of the spirit within you which you have received at a very smaller measure which is now calling they say birds of a feather they flock together you need an anointing to hunger for the anointing an anointing to hunger for the anointing same applies with wisdom if you don't have wisdom let he who doesn't have wisdom ask for it and how do you ask for wisdom if you don't have wisdom to know that you don't have it you need wisdom there is a measure of wisdom needed so that you realize that i am in this situation today because of lack of wisdom it calls for wisdom for you to know that you need wisdom and yet the bible is saying if you realize that you don't have it ask for it yet you can never realize that you don't have it unless you have it there's no way that you can know that i need wisdom unless it is wisdom that you have that is telling you that you need more of this so all of us here we are already anointed but it is that little anointing that has come for a greater measure what has transported you from your home what has brought you here is not your car what has brought you here is a measure of an anointing it's a measure of wisdom but that measure has been always telling you that i'm not sufficient to get the job done and also when i called for a seminar deep responded deep 
calleth unto deep. And when deep calls, what responds is deep. So there, there, is, there is nothing ordinary about you. There is something in you that had. The moment, the first time that you had, there was this program. Something inside of you, which is not you, just jumped up. And you knew there was something about this gathering. And we made it so difficult so that we would only have the deep attending. Be seated. Be seated. Be seated. I want us to talk about something very important. Things that I will say here. Okay, read it again. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth uh -huh. with the Holy Ghost uh -huh. and with power. Yes. Who went about doing good. Good. Yeah, huh? what was and, the good that he did? And healing all that were oppressed. How many? All. That were what? Oppressed. Those that were oppressed. Got healed. He went about doing what? Who went about doing good? Uh huh. And healing. Healing. All uh -huh. that were oppressed. By who? Of the devil. For what? For God was, was with him. For God was with him. It wasn't just a gift from God to heal the oppressed that he had. At one level, God gave him a gift to heal the oppressed. At another level, God had to give himself to Jesus so that Jesus is gifted with God. You get to that level in ministry where God himself looks around and he finds that there is no reward. There is no salary sufficient for you and then he tells you Abraham I I am thy shield and, and thy exceeding great, great reward thank you you are at a level where now God becomes your salary God becomes your allowance God becomes your bonus you build by God you invest at the level of God. When God comes into your life and he replaces finances, it's another, okay, we, we will get to finances. We will get to that. For God was with him. So at that level of ministry, God becomes an anointing that you carry. You are not just anointed by God, but the God that has anointed you is with you. And you do what you do based on not just the gift that you got from God, but you do things according to the God who gifted you. You will realize that you find yourself doing too many things. And people will begin to wonder, so tell, how many gifts do you have then? You seem to be able to do almost everything. A gifted person cannot do so much. 
you have to be restricted to the area of your gifting. But when it is God that you have, who is the giver of gifts, and he's present, there is a continuous supply of abilities when a need arises. And you perform not according to the measure of the gift, but you perform according to the presence of the giver of gifts. Because he is present there in time of need. He is forever present. He makes that action available when it is needed. When you are challenged, having never prophesied before, and you are challenged to deliver a message prophetically, and then you deliver it. And you cannot remember ever receiving that gift, but you can remember receiving the giver of the gifts. This is why I believe that I can do all things through through Christ. Through Christ. Through Christ. Through Christ. Christ. Now, when he says through Christ, he's not saying through Jesus. Now, let me explain. Now, now, now. Already you can see now that we are being referred to Jesus who was of Nazareth. Oh, wow. This was before Jesus became the Christ. Oh. Now, it's important that before we look at what the anointing is, let's look at also how. It's right at the beginning of the passage of scripture and it's so small that you can miss it. How do you start a letter by saying how God anointed Jesus? The how. The how. How. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Not Christ. Jesus who was of Nazareth. Realizing that there is an assignment that God wanted performed and people from Nazareth cannot carry that level of assignment. Looking at where you are coming from, all of you here, and the things that you want to do in the kingdom. Ah, something will have to be done at a certain point. Where you say, from there... To hear, I was Jesus of Nazareth. But from here going forward. Do you know that when a seminar which is meant for leaders is conducted sufficiently according to the desire of the spirit. Even those present that might have not received a call into ministry. The seminar can become the defining moment. And if you are able to understand what I'm going to teach today, this seminar is enough to become an encounter. Everything, the voice of God, the bending of the bush can be compressed and summarized as a seminar. <laughs> and you come without a call and you leave with a massive calling. You cannot leave this place and go back home and claim that you have never been called by God. It's not possible. It's not possible. You came here because I called you. If I, if I called you because I was called, you need to understand who called you. Now, sit down. Let me, let me show you. Very soon, I will show you just to support what I've just said. 
you see that there are, there are three men that have been sent by Cornelius to go and call Peter. And before they called Peter, God spoke to Peter and he said, do not hesitate to entertain these, these men and follow them for I have sent them. Yet they were sent by Cornelius. Okay, all right, all right. That, that's the story that we're reading now. You see, Cornelius was told by the angel of the Lord to send men to Joppa. Because there was a Simon there who had a surname called Peter. Peter. Mm -hmm. Who was staying with the Simon who was a tenor. And, 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 and Cornelius was told by the angel of the Lord to call servants and to send them. And they were called by Cornelius. It was never an angel that they saw. They saw Cornelius. And Cornelius sent them. On the other side, God came to introduce the men, three men that Cornelius had sent. And God said to Peter, do not hesitate. Do not be afraid to entertain the three men that you are going to meet downstairs. For I have sent them. But are they aware that they have been called by God? And they have been sent by God. All they can remember is Cornelius inviting them for a seminar. They never got to see the angel that Cornelius had seen. But there's something about seeing the man that has seen. There is something about it. Okay, we'll get to that. Why am I touching on Cornelius? Because that's the same chapter. Be seated, please. That is the same chapter. In case you're wondering, where is this story coming from? Before I show you how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, you need to understand who was speaking there. It was Peter. Where? In Cornelius' house. It was the how. Peter was able to explain the process. How Jesus got anointed. He explained it to a degree where the anointing fell. And Cornelius became anointed because of the way he did not explain how Jesus was anointed until Cornelius understood. He explained it until Cornelius was connected to the same anointing. So we will explain it until a connection is established. You have heard several men of God talk about the anointing. Because it stands out. It's right inside of the scripture. But there is a how at the beginning. How God anointed. If you are to understand how then you will see how easy it is for God to anoint you during this gathering. How? How? There is nothing that you have seen me do that you cannot do better. Do you know that when, when the Lord told me this, it, it was a message that I tried to ignore, but he kept on telling me, he told me point blank. That do you know that you can raise better and bigger prophets than you, than you can prophesy? Your ability to raise is greater than your ability to prophesy. You told me that. 
You told me that. He told me that. Your ability to raise, <laughs> to bring about a personality much more potent, much more powerful than you, you have that grace. It's greater than what you are doing yourself. So I'm aware when I said, okay, let me invite your people then. He said, go ahead. <laughs> Everything that you have seen me do that you have admired, it's nothing compared to what you can do if you are to understand the how part. <laughs> I can push you into areas where I would look at you and wonder, how did you get there? He has told me that he has given me the ability. Okay. While Peter yet spake these words, uh -huh. the Holy Ghost fell on all them. While, while Peter was saying these things, the Holy Ghost fell on them. Which heard. Which what? Which heard. Which what? Which heard. Which what? Which heard. Which what? Which heard. Okay. Sit down, please. Let me show you something here. Let me show you something. There is something that I want you to see. You realize that Peter, being as Jewish as he was, and... Having seen in a revelation, he's being kept, his logic in, a, in an apartment, he's being kept by another Simon, who is not Peter, of course, who is the tenor, he's known for his profession. And Peter is there in Joppa. And Peter got hungry. He was hungry. And he went up to pray. And then he slept. He fell into a trance then the heavens open and there was a provision from heaven that came down set right before him and a voice accompanied that vision and the voice said, Peter, rise up. There was a name. In case you think we have given you this food so that you give it to somebody else. Peter, rise up, kill, and eat. Why am I explaining this? So that you understand, never forget. It was Cornelius being told how Jesus was anointed. So I have to explain that part. And Peter responded to the voice by saying, I have never in my life eaten something this common. This what you have given to me to kill and eat is unclean. And the voice said, do not say that something that I have sanctified is unclean. So the creatures in the fabric, in the material, had already been sanctified before they were brought before Peter. And yet Peter was not anointed enough to descend the level of sanctification that the creatures had undergone. So there's a problem with Peter to a point where even if he's to go out there and do a crusade, he has no way of understanding whether the people have been sanctified or not. So your discernment, the way you measure sanctification is faulty. How is it that God can sanctify a creature to a point where you find it 
coming not from the forest, from heaven, a place that you all desire. It's coming from heaven. It's even closer to God than you are. It's coming from a place that you yearn to visit. That level of sanctification, still Peter calls it unclean, coming from the very presence of God. If you cannot understand the process that the pig has gone through, How are you going to rate your members? How are you going to understand the people? He still insists that it's unclean. I cannot eat that. There were different kinds of creatures including birds. And then it was lifted up brought down again the second time. He denied, he refused again. And then it was lifted up and it was brought down the third time. We want to get to how. But it's important for me to have you understand where this is happening so that you can appreciate the how part. So start from where um, the angel of the Lord comes and he appears to Cornelius and he tells him that your prayers and your alms have reached God, have reached heaven and I have come. Verse 1. Yes. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. Cornelius was a centurion of the Italian band. There was a what? There was a certain man in Caesarea called mm. Cornelius. Yes. A centurion of the band called the Italian band. Yes. A devout man. He was committed, yes. And one that feared God with all his house. He feared God and he was able to influence his entire house. They were all partakers of the fear of God that he had for God. He, he convinced his people to join him in fearing God. This man is a leader. So this man, apart from just being a centurion, apart from being the head of a certain department elsewhere, he has a ministry. Being able to bring your entire generation under the fear of the Lord. He is a church that he is running, being a Gentile. He is a ministry. He has a ministry even before he understood how people get anointed for ministry. He, he, Yes. 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 You know it. You can save God before you know God. Samuel saved God under Eli. Yet he had not yet known the Lord. Neither was even the voice of the Lord revealed to him. Yet he was already saving So Cornelius now, he's committed to prayer, he's fasting, he's looking after the needy. To a certain point, and something is happening now. Uh -huh. Which gave much alms to the people yes. and prayed to God always. Prayed to who? God. How many times? Always. Always, yes. He saw in a vision evidently. My God. And then he saw in a vision he's yet to be baptized. 
He is yet to receive the Holy Ghost. Yet he's already into vision dimensions. He saw. Imagine what you will see after the Holy Ghost has come. If you were seeing before. Have a picture of that. Just have a picture of that. He saw in a vision what? Evidently. Evidently. Uh huh. About the ninth hour ninth of the day. Ninth hour of the day. Yes. An angel of God coming in to him. We'll talk about that again because some of you you need to understand because you've had interactions with these beings several times and messages have been given and I'll clarify things to you. Then you will remember, you will know that God indeed has given you an assignment. That was not an ordinary person that came to you. I'll explain that part. Evidently, an angel of the Lord walked in. Uh -huh. Into him. Uh -huh. Saying unto him, and he said, the angel that came said unto him, again, Cornelius. Cornelius. Yes. And when he looked on him, mm -hmm. he was afraid. When he looked on him, he was afraid. Yet he had seen him walking, coming in. He's explaining to us... In a vision, he saw the angel of the Lord coming in to him. He saw, he's seeing him, the angel coming. And yet the angel still went on to call him by name Cornelius. And then Cornelius looked at the angel that he had seen walking, coming in. It was after the angel had actually called him by name that he then looked at the angel that he was seeing all along and then he became afraid. The same angel. The same angel. This. No, you didn't get that part. You didn't get that part. He's the one telling us that he saw the angel coming in. He was seeing the angel that was coming in to him. And the angel then said, Cornelius. And then Cornelius looked at the angel. And then he became afraid. Let me try to explain that. How come the angel was coming in, he was walking towards him, he wasn't afraid until Cornelius was called. And then when Cornelius looked at the angel, Cornelius became afraid. It is because the first encounter was in a vision form. And you know when sometimes you're seeing things in a vision, there is a certain stability, grace to, to withstand an experience is given to you. There are things that you can handle in a dream that you cannot handle in physical reality. So, it happened also to Peter when he thought it was a vision, how he was being delivered, until he was brought to a Peter dimension, his physical reality. Then he realized that God had sent his angel, yet he thought it was happening in a revelation, in a vision. So while Cornelius thought it was a vision, he had to be called out of that mysterious state. So Cornelius has to be awakened to the reality of the presence of the angel so that he understands that I'm not in your vision, I'm in your house. This is why now when he was brought to this awareness that I really have an angel standing right next to me. It's not in a vision. So the word Cornelius, you think it's just a name. No, it was an invitation 
from what he thought was a vision. Now he was awake. The same way when you are asleep and somebody calls you by name, immediately you do what? You wake up. So you're coming to another dimension. So that's exactly why would the angel of the Lord look at Cornelius and he sees that Cornelius is looking. Why would you call him Cornelius? And after he was called Cornelius, then he looked and then he became afraid. He wasn't afraid before. Are you following this? Are you following this? So Cornelius, when, he, when Cornelius came back from a vision experience and he realizes that, no, the angel is actually here. So Cornelius, come! from your vision let's see each other face to face it's me here and it's you at that level of interaction he could not withstand the presence of that angel are you following so he wants this not just to remain a vision it has to be an experience Evidently. Evidently. I don't want you to think that maybe it was just a mere dream. Let it start like a vision and then I will call you from the vision to this physical reality so that you will know that I'm here. So that's what is happening there. So he was afraid. And when he looked on him, he was afraid mm -hmm. and said, What is it, Lord? Who? Lord. What is it, who? Lord. What is it, who? Lord. You know, Lord means honor. How is it that Cornelius is able to sense ownership? This man had not come driving a fancy car. This man has not declared his title deeds to maybe properties that he owns somewhere. He is just by himself and yet there is an anointing on his life of ownership. You can look at a man and know what he owns without him having to carry what he owns. He calls him Lord. That title cannot be given to you unless something else has been given to you. You must be having control over something for you to be Lord. Lord. He sensed that. He sensed that this is the Lord. Uh-huh. And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Yes. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. Who is supposed to send? Cornelius. He's being instructed to send. And the men that are supposed to be sent are not going to have this same experience of having an angel walk up to them and tell them to go to Joppa. They will wait for an angel for the rest of their lives. What will come to them as an experience is a physical Cornelius. And they have to respect they have to understand that Cornelius will become their most explosive supernatural encounter. The angel is interested in man being sent to Joppa. But the angel did not go to the man. Because the angel doesn't want to become their experience. The angel wants their experience to be Cornelius. The angel wants those people 
not to interact with angels. He, he wants those people to interact with a man who has interacted with angels. So, I can only come to you as an angel this far. Everything else that is going to be done in terms of callings, it will have to be you identifying individuals and you sent them. And wherever they go, God himself will introduce them as the one who has sent them. What, what are you going to do in case God is not interested in talking to you? Dad? What are you going to do if angels doesn't, are not interested in appearing to you? There is still something that can be done. There is that facility in the kingdom of God. Yes. Ah. If I can get to see a man who is seen. And then he tells me of his experiences. His experience becomes my experience. Yes. Now, do you know that in life you can never say that you've never seen an angel if you've seen a man who has seen an angel? Sit down, sit down, let me show you something. Remember, I once, I once taught you, I once taught you that it was just Moses all by himself. The bush was burning and then God said, go. But before you meet, you confront the system of Pharaoh. Go and gather the elders of Israel. And then together you go before Pharaoh. And they went before Pharaoh. And all of the elders, they went before Pharaoh. And they said to Pharaoh, the God of our father has appeared unto us. All of them. All of them. The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. With him. With him. Us. 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 He has met, they were so sure, evidently, that the God of the Hebrews had met with us. They were not there when the God of the Hebrews met with Moses. They were not there. Yet they were so sure. So we leave the burning bush with you, Moses. It's your God and your burning bush. Don't make a mistake of coming to us having had such an experience yeah. your experience immediately becomes our inheritance we inherit whatever god would have told you and we can face systems with boldness knowing that god has appeared unto us unto us That's why I'm saying, if a man has had an experience with God and he comes to you, you are having an experience with God. This is not something that is anything to do with playing with people's minds. No, this is a reality. The entire structures of Israel, everyone had one message. The Lord has appeared unto us. So take me to the place of your encounter. They will take them to Moses. Yeah. Moses will take you to the burning bush. So I'm not going to wait until I get a Moses experience where I have to see what he saw. I have to see the Moses that saw. Yes. When I can have that, yes. Yes. I can confront any demonic system. Yes with confidence that the Lord has appeared unto me and he spoke to me. We'll get to the anointing very soon. So please bear with me. You will know what it is. You will know what it is. Ah. Okay. Now, now let's hear. And now send men to Joppa. Send. You will go ahead and send Men where? To Joppa. So even their destiny, their destination Thank you. is determined. Mm -hmm. You send men and you have to give them a location so that they know where exactly they have been sent to. Mm -hmm. They must understand their location. There is a jurisdiction 
There is a boundary. There is a limitation to their calling. If they go elsewhere, they might not realize the result. Because Peter, who is Simon, is not in every place. So these men that you call and you send, you must be able to give them a location. Because it's not in every place where they will find what they are looking for. It might appear to them as though they were never called and they were never sent. They will begin to question the integrity of the angel that appeared unto you. Assignments have locations. There is a place where you function well. If you are a fish, stay in water. If you are a bird, stay in the air. There must, there is a place where you flourish. There is a place where you become you. And there is a place that will reveal your weaknesses. You will always know every time you try to do ministry, ministry will be proving to you that you are not good at it. Not because you are not good at it, but because you are in a wrong place, wrong location. The people that you call take time to articulate, give them a map. They must know where Peter is found. He is not everywhere. So when you finally find yourself ministering in a place where you have been sent, it will not just be you introducing yourself to them. Before you arrive, God himself will have to convince Peter not to argue with you. So most of the people that we're preaching to, God himself has not yet preached to them. Most of the people that we're trying to preach to now and they are resisting our message is because God himself has not yet... We are arriving before God even arrives. They arrived when God himself was busy giving revelations and visions to Peter just so that Peter would not need one week conference to be convinced or to be converted. There are people that are having visions of you, dreams of you even before you arrive. So by the time you arrive, they are already convinced. And you will do less even in terms of miracles before you convince them. You will do less in terms of prophecies before they believe in you. There are people that you will raise from the dead and from the graveside, they will walk back home. They will never come to your ministry. And there are people that will follow you forever, yet you have never healed them from, from their headache. And you wonder how come this person has been following me even after discovering that you are weak in certain areas, they will keep following you. Why? They were convinced by God before you even arrived. So your assignment, you need to identify people that have already been convinced by God that you are coming. That becomes the place for you. Did God not say to his prophet, go, there is a widow, and I have commanded the widow to what? To feed you there. So who arrived first? God had already. So all that the prophet needed to do was to identify not just any other widow. It's not every other widow that is going to sustain you. It's a commanded widow. So it's not a widow that you will find with a cup of oil. No, it's a widow that you will find with a commandment. You look for a woman who doesn't just have flour. 
search for a woman who has been commanded and that woman will sustain your ministry. That's how you know that I have discovered my correct location. Somebody out there believe in you. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Thank you. But there's a little part that God will have to leave out for you. You get to the woman that has been commanded by the Lord to sustain you. She's not going to automatically start sustaining you. Huh? Yes. <laughs> so you don't just fold your hands and you think people are going to. No? 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 She will act as if she, she never. Does this look like a woman that has been commanded by the Lord? So you will meet people like that in ministry. They will act like they don't even care about you. Don't buy into that. They are pretending. You, you cannot be ignored. Ah. He still had to instruct the woman that was already commanded. But the question is, but if he was commanded by the Lord, are we supposed to command them again? Who are we? They are supposed to listen to God. Yet that is, the, that, that is how God's system works. So if he was commanded, if she was commanded and they still have to command her, what did God command her? So how, how am I going to know? You will know if you command the already commanded. The level of obedience, swiftness. Then you will know that I've laid my word upon God's word. She had heard already, so it's easier for you now to convince her. So even the people that God has already preached to, they will not be born again until we preach to them. We have to command the already commanded. We have to instruct the already instructed. And how are we going to know they have been instructed already by God? They will be so swift, so quick to believe in what you say. Then you will know it was not because of my power. God had already visited Peter way before we arrived. So keep on reading. And now send men to Joppa. Yes. And call one Simon. Yes. Whose name is Peter. Yes. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner. Yes. Whose house is by the seaside. Mm -hmm. he you shall see, tell directions. Them. The house is by the seaside. He was so precise. The angel. Oh. Ah. Move on. Ye shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. What is Peter going to do when he comes? Tell. You need to learn to take seriously a man who comes to tell. Of all the things that can be done in ministry, a man with an ability to tell, that's a gift from God. He will tell. All this drama is just so that somebody comes to tell. He will tell you what to do. What is it that Cornelius was supposed to do after the arrival of Peter, because remember he was fasting, before he was told he was praying, before he was, he was giving alms. Yet he needs to be told what to do.
That's the problem that most of us men of God have, having prayed, having fasted, having given, and having received. To be told that you still need to be told. <laughs> ha! I need to be told what to do. In which area now? I have exhausted all of the areas in ministry to be told what to do. This man was already in terms of occupation, he was well placed. Yet he was yet to do. Because he was yet to be told. He is yet to discover his actual occupation. Yet he was already a centurion. At this age, he is yet to do. You are yet to start. I'm not saying this to look down on you. I will say, I will articulate to a point where you and we will agree that indeed, men of God, I had not yet what? Started. I will start from here. When we explain miracles, I will, I will line them, I will put them here in a way that you, it would be like an outline. You, you conduct miracles like you are, you, are, you are a pilot. You know what to check before you take off. So, where are we? Verse 6. Uh -huh. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. He shall tell you. Who is going to tell you? Peter. Who is going to tell you? Peter. Who is going to tell him? Peter. Who is going to tell you? Peter. The angel, the angel, the angel is speaking. But he's not telling. He's not telling. He's not telling him what to do a man who has had an experience with an angel might still not know what to do i'm telling you i've some of you because when a man tells you that i've had experiences you think he knows what to do and you follow An angel that has come into your house, all he does is to tell you that there's a man out there who can tell you what to do. It means there are things that you will know only when it is Peter in this house after I'm gone. And the angel of God, because there is so much order in that kingdom, he made sure that he would not touch on that kind of information yeah. that only Peter yes. is supposed to talk about. Yeah. So all I can do as the angel of God with, with all this brightness there are things that I cannot tell you. I can come here and, 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 and shine all over the place. I will still leave you ignorant as to what exactly it is that you're supposed to do. You will be a man with experiences, but not having knowledge on what to do. There are men that are so gifted in, th in the things of the spirit, and yet they are so much ignorant. You can look at a man and you can see that the man, the woman, doesn't know what to do. But ask him about experiences in the spirit. Massive. 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 So when I'm gone, you must invite a personality who doesn't glitter like myself. And yet he will bring you to your destiny. 
with less glory. That's what he's saying. That's what the angel is saying. The angel is saying, when I'm gone, make sure Peter comes here. Lest you remain ignorant, having had an experience with me, with all this glory. You must invite a person who is not shining like I'm shining, who looks like a man just like yourself, but an experience, one encounter with such a man, you will be left knowing what to do. He has the grace to make you know what you ought to do. What you've been praying for, you've been fasting. You realize later when he begins to explain it to Peter. When, he, when Cornelius starts explaining the vision he had to Peter, he did not say the angel said unto me your prayers. He said the angel said unto me your prayer is heard. So there was a specific area that Cornelius kept on him. He wanted to understand something. What am I supposed to do? There, there were so many other prayers, but there was this one prayer in particular which was the major focus. He kept on praying for one thing. And that's what the angel had come to what? To answer. And then, and then, and then, we'll get to that soon. We'll get to that point. But I want to talk about the anointing. All right. Where are we? Verse 7. Uh -huh. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed. When the angel that spake unto Cornelius was departed. The end of the experience. The man is gone. What did Cornelius do? He called two of his household we servants. Who is calling them? Cornelius. They are being called by who? Cornelius. The servants are being called by who? Cornelius. It's a calling, right? Yes. They are being called. Yes. They are being called yes. by Cornelius. They are being invited. They are being brought closer to Cornelius. Cornelius calls the servants and there was another one a soldier, a committed soldier, who was also invited, who was also called. He called the servants. He called two of his household servants. Let's number them one, two, right? Of, of what? Household servants. Household servants, yes. And a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. Continually, this one would not disappear. So the first time that this man has to leave the presence of Cornelius is when Cornelius had called him so that he would send him away. So again, you see, he thought his call his calling was so that he is always with Cornelius. And then he was called by Cornelius. So that he would know what to do also. And the only time that he was serving Cornelius well was when he was away from Cornelius. There are those who think that they are serving well because of proximity. Yet you can serve well being away. If this man was close, this is, an, this is an army general. This is a military guy. He was always present for how long? Waited on him continually. Continually. So it's something that you are supposed to, <laughs> that you are supposed to. <laughs> okay, let me spend most of my time. 
<laughs> okay. So, it means at this particular moment, Cornelius is comfortable not having his security personnel around. His willingness to be exposed to that extent where the most trusted person has to be released. And you go on a mission that has nothing to do with military. How can three men carry such a very simple assignment? Go and find Simon, whose same name is Peter. And you need an army. A guy with a military background to go and just look and find for what purpose? He's a very smart guy. He wasn't told who exactly to send, but he had wisdom. He had wisdom. Because Peter has to see. The arrival of this delegation has to be a message to Peter. I need individuals who can describe and define me so that in case Peter has not had a vision from the Lord to convince him to come, I need a decorated individual so that Peter understands he's not coming to have a meeting with an average guy. I've released my only security. I'm a heavily guarded, guarded person. And these are my servants. At least he's likely to honor that and come. It was now him knowing who to send. Presentation is key. They might not believe in you, not because they don't believe in you, but because they don't believe in your entourage. Yeah. Your structure, the people that represent you is going to become your greatest evil spirit that you have to deal with. Who speaks on your behalf? Who goes ahead of you? So he made sure that there was a well-decorated guy amongst the servants. There is need for somebody who has a good background. He let him accompany the two. So they went. Now, let's read it. Sit, be seated, please. Be seated, be seated. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to When John. he, who? Cornelius. Had what? Had declared... All, these, All things. these things unto them. What are these things? The encounter, the experience. Thank you. Thank you. He had to declare all of these things. So the things were, had to be declared to them. He did not invite the angel to come and confirm. No, he had to declare the things. And they were supposed to believe that our master has had an experience. So the things were declared unto them. That became their fuel. They were empowered by a declaration of an encounter that they never had. It was declared unto them. So I will declare some things to you very soon. You understand. You will understand. You will understand. Lest you think maybe my encounter was just for me. No. It was so that I declare to the right people. And then they are dispatched. 
you see what another man's encounter can produce for you. You see. Yes. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Yes. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, mm -hmm. Peter went up upon the housetop to pray yes. about the sixth hour. Yes. And he became very hungry uh -huh. and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. While they were making ready the food, he fell into what? A trance. Into a trance. Yes. And saw heaven opened. Whilst he's in a trance, then he saw heaven. It opened up. Yes. And a certain vessel descending unto him. Yes. As it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners mm -hmm. and let down to the earth. Yes, let's move. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth. Follow this. And wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. Yes. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Yes. But Peter said, not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. You call it what? Common. common, yes. And the voice spake unto him again the second time. The second time. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. What God had what? Cleansed. What God has cleansed, don't, do not call it common, yes. This was done thrice, mm. and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Yes. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. He did not understand what he had seen. He has doubt. Uh -huh. Behold. Behold. At the time he was doubting, wanting to understand the interpretation of the vision. What arrived was the interpretation. He wants God to explain the vision and there is a knock at the door and what is knocking at the door is the answer to the question is the interpretation of the vision while he was doubting uh -huh, wanting to understand the meaning of the vision now while peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean mm. Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house mm. and stood before the gate. Yes. And called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. Mm -hmm. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him. While Peter thought on the vision, the what? The Spirit what, the spirit what? Said. The spirit what? Said. <laughs> what said to Peter? The spirit. And the spirit said to Peter, what? Behold, three men seek thee. Uh-huh. Arise therefore, and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing. Why? For I have sent them. 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 Who had sent them? Who had sent them? But the question is, these three men, do they know? Who sent them? I know the Spirit knows. I know God knows. Do they know?
It was Cornelius who chose these men. It wasn't a list of names given to Cornelius to say, make sure so and so is, is part of the, the crew. No, it was Cornelius who chose the men. And the Spirit of God is introducing these men in a new, completely new territory. There are people that have come into this place that I, the Spirit, have sent. The question is, yes, having the Spirit knowing that, it's one thing. You knowing that, that becomes your strength in ministry. Knowing that. Knowing what the Spirit knows about you. Knowing what the Spirit knows about you. What is being said about you by the Spirit is very key, important. What is being said about you by the Spirit is what gives you power in ministry. I would have wanted the situation, if I were one of those guys, I would have wanted the spirit, not just to, to talk about me to Peter, at least talk to me. Tell me that it's you sending me. So, do not resist these men. Do not hesitate. And there's a reason. Read it again. Arise therefore and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So, come down from the top of the house, meet these men, and also go with them. And all the way, make sure you don't doubt. Who is making sure that they are not doubted? The Spirit is making sure that the follower, in this case it was Peter, following, because mm. he didn't even know where he was going. Mm. A man who is supposed to be followed is following. He has been in ministry for years. Somebody has just been recruited. This is his first missionary <laughs> journey. They go out there not looking for sinners. They go out there looking for Peter, an established man of God. Callings are different. Follow them without doubting. Go with them. Yes? For I have sent them. Yes. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> and said, Behold, I am ye whom ye seek. Mm -hmm. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? I still want to know. Why have you come? Uh -huh. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God. Hear, hear, hear these people. Presentation. What are they saying about you? Hear how they introduce a man who is even absent. While he is not even there. What is the reason why you people are here? Let's listen to it again. And they said. And they said. 
Cornelius the centurion. Look at how they studied. Cornelius the centurion. The centurion. Yes. A just man. Yes. And one that feareth God. You should hear what your workers say about you. These are servants. They are still servants. It means Cornelius still has more money than they, than they have. Yet if you have a wrong servant, as long as your money, your account is bigger than his, such words can never, he can never call you just. You will have people like that in your ministry. As long as he has a lesser car, he might not say it in your presence. But deep down inside, there is a level of, lack, there's a lack of satisfaction. As long as your house is bigger than his, your car is bigger than his, and so on. He, wait until you hear what he says while he's away from you. They call him just. How much are they getting paid a month? Yet they call him a just man. What he, he's just because what he gives us is fair. It's enough for the kind of service that we have given to him. They are honest enough to know that I don't deserve the kind of a life that my boss is living. They are honest. That's why he chose them. He knew how they would introduce him to Peter. Uh huh. And of good report among all the nation of the Jews. He has a good report. <laughs> they are not assuming that he is known already. They are not assuming. Because if he has a good report and so, they are not supposed to get into details. Because then Peter is supposed to know him. But still they have to emphasize he has a good report. Among all, all the nation of the Jews. Even the Jews. You being a Jew, you must have heard of this person. If you didn't, there's something wrong with you. This is a Roman. He's a Roman. And yet his reputation has penetrated even the Jewish nation. They know him. Yes? was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house mm -hmm. and to hear words of thee. To hear? Words. 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 Of who? Of thee. Words of thee. This is something that ought to be said, and it is important who says it. You must hear words, and the words are supposed to come from only Simon Peter. If the same exact words are said by somebody else, they carry a different meaning. It matters who says what you hear. You might hear some things during this seminar that you might have heard before, but it's important. Now, it has to be Peter telling you. If it wasn't about who says, the angel would have said it. That is why the angel never said what Peter is coming to say, because it matters who says what is being said. Is that clear? Am I, am I manipulating scriptures here? No. If it doesn't matter who says it, then the angel should have said it. Yes. Yes. Go and call for Peter. So, so there are so many other apostles. Why Peter? So you are not in any competition. Don't be in a rush. Fearing that maybe if somebody starts before I start. No. 
Certain words are reserved. You will come 10 years later after they are gone and you will say exactly what they said but the results will be different. Ah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not about trying to find something new. You feel like, oh, the Bible is almost finished. No, 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 no. You will come later and say exactly what they said. But watch the outcome. Watch the level of impact. Can we not all call the name Jesus, yet results are There is an authorization to utter certain words and they become a key combination to the supernatural. Ah, uh, okay, sit down. Uh huh. Then called he them in and lodged them. So he said, okay, spend a night here. Peter is being kept. I don't know why he would invite people. This is not your house. Sir. But he, he said, okay, spend the night here and then we'll go tomorrow morning. Uh. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And also certain brethren from Joppa also accompanied who? Peter. Uh -huh. And the morrow after, they entered into Caesarea. Mm -hmm. And Cornelius waited for them. Cornelius is waiting for them. And also Cornelius had invited people. Knowing for sure that Peter is coming. There's no way he can resist my invitation. He had already gathered people together. Knowing that Peter is, is coming. Why is it that Cornelius is having so much respect for Peter? Yet he had had an encounter with an angel. He knows that Peter has had an encounter with the Lord of angels, Jesus. He has been with Jesus even physically. It takes wisdom for you to understand that. So he's waiting. Everyone is there. Okay. He's coming. And Cornelius waited for them mm -hmm. and called together his kinsmen and near friends. Yes. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet. That was outside. Cornelius came outside of his uh, property, he saw Peter, fell down, and he worshipped him. And worshipped him. Is it there? Yes, ma'am. He fell down on his feet and he worshipped him. Him. Worshipped him. Worshipped him. And Peter said, Do not do that. I'm just like, I'm also a man like you. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up. Who I took him up? Peter. It was Peter. Peter took him up and he said, what? Stand up. I myself also am a man. I myself also am a man. Okay. And now, if you see what is happening there, the scripture doesn't just start to when Peter lifted up Cornelius and said, please don't do what you're doing. No. Still Cornelius had to do that. Even Peter to understand whether he was dealing with the right person. Of which what he did according to scripture is wrong. You are not supposed to worship a man of God. I know it's, it's being said everywhere else. But you understand most of these people that do not believe in this. And this really, they, are, they become really angry about this issue. Get them arrested, they go to court, they'll say, you're worship. 
you, you it, it will still happen. But anyway, in as much as what he did was wrong, the wrong thing had to be done for Peter to understand the, his, the level of humility. He is a centurion for God's sake. He is doing this in the presence of his servants. Some of them are there. They are seeing him for the very first time. And he is confirming to Peter that what you heard about me, that I fear the Lord. I fear God. It's something that you carry that I'm worshipping. If you are not smart, you will take that as a doctrine and say, this is what Peter said. Don't worship him because I'm just like a man. And then you believe. You believe what Peter is telling you. If he is like you, if he is like you, if he is like you, if that's true what Peter is saying, that he is just like you, why would the angel of God advise you to invite somebody who is just like you to come and do the same things that you can do for yourself. You might take that as a doctrine, but look at how deceptive men of God can do. It's a competition of humility. Cornelius wanting to humble himself, Peter also feels like it's time for me to also humble myself. But these two people are different. Why would you believe that? That Peter is just like you. So that's how humble men of God get away. With situations where they are put in a tight corner. He can tell you, the men of God can tell you, I don't have what you're looking for. And you believe it and you walk away empty-handed. It's a statement of humility. Did Naomi not say, I have nothing left? Look at me. She's telling you that I'm done. I have nothing for you that I can offer. And one member believed her. And another member said, this cannot be true. You might not be in a position to conceive, but you have relatives. You have connections. And she said, your God shall be my God and your people. I know that you have your people. Yeah. Yet she had humbly declared that even if I'm to get a man today, shall I get pregnant? Shall you wait for that little boy? Another person believed that she's now empty. She's exhausted. She's finished. The grace is over. And they walk out of your ministry thinking that you are done. It would have been you actually convincing them. There are moments when you have to present a sermon like that. There are people that are following you today that you have to sit down with them at some point and convince them to leave you. It's biblical. Did Jesus not say to his disciples after others had left, how about you? What are you still doing here? There is one sermon that gathers. There is another sermon that has to scatter. You will find people in your life that you have to discourage from following you. I have people that I call friends. And they believe it. 
<laughs> sit down, sit down, please. <laughs> and they won't bother you for anything. So in case you take that and you say, it's doctrinal, we should never worship a man exactly. And then Peter says, I'm just like you. We'll see when you speak. We'll see. Because if I'm, if I'm like you, you should have found these, all these kinsmen that I have speaking in tongues. Because I've been speaking to them all along, waiting for you. I was preaching to them. Yet nothing like the Holy Ghost ever came. So I will see if I'm like you. Let's see as you speak. So he picked him up. They walked in. Yes. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. Yes. And he said unto them, ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of you them. You all know, all of you people, you know that I'm in the wrong place. You know that I'm not supposed to be here today. That's how he started his sermon. Before we get to how. I'm not supposed to be here. A Jew is not supposed to eat with you guys. It's unlawful. Uh-huh. But God hath shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Not, not any creature. Not any beast. You see the interpretation now? So what was in the vessel? Huh? Men. Men were in that material. Now Peter knows what he called common and unclean was not even people. There were no people in that vessel. They were creatures, different beasts, which were known to be unclean in the Old Testament, symbolizing the Gentile nations. Okay, so don't eat them, don't interact with them, don't commune with them. That was the statement. So it is, it is now time for the Jews to interact with what? With the Gentiles. But he doesn't have an interpretation what is really represented by the creature? But now he understands. He says, God has stopped me from calling you guys unclean. Are you following this? Yes. It's important under the prophetic of which we are not dealing with that now. How you also appear to people. You appear there is what? They appear to you is what? Because there was not a single human being in that vessel that came from heaven. These were creatures. These were animals. And yet now Peter knows, he understands that what I called unclean was a human being. You appear in what form? To people. I'm not supposed to be here, but I'm here because the Lord has spoken. Yes? Therefore came I unto you without gain saying, mm -hmm. As soon as I was sent for. As soon as I was, as soon as. It was quick. Not because of the people that you sent. God had already spoken to me. So it was so quick. I'm here because he had spoken to me. Before your people what? Spoke to me. I'm here. Yes? I ask therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me? Yes. And Cornelius said, four days ago. Now he's asking again, Cornelius. 
Why did you send these people? The people that were sent by Cornelius were also interviewed by Peter. Now he's asking Cornelius, why did you send these people? And then he says, four days ago. <sighs> four days ago. What happened? I was fasting until this hour. I was in prayer. I was fasting until this same hour. Mm -hmm. Same hour. Same hour. I don't know how you arrived at the same hour. The same time that that man arrived. I don't know what it is with you people. There was another man four days ago, it's the same hour where you're standing now. Uh huh. And at the ninth hour, I mm. prayed in my house. Yes. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing mm -hmm. and said, Cornelius. <sighs> yes. Thy prayer is heard, and thine arms... Thy prayers. Prayer. Thy prayer is heard. Before, the angel had said, your prayers and your arms. But he knew exactly that this man had come for one prayer that I'd, I'd, I'd met. Thy prayer and... Thy prayer is heard, yes. and thine arms are had in remembrance in the sight. God. Yes. Send therefore to Joppa. Send therefore to Joppa. And call hither Simon, mm -hmm. whose surname is Peter. Yes. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner. We were told. Seaside. We were told. We picked your location from here as Gentiles. We knew where you were. Peter is witnessing this level of prophetic in a Gentile gathering. He had never seen it before. Yeah. They are prophesying way before they are baptized yeah. in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Peter cannot comprehend what is happening. Yeah. Yeah. My God. My God. You mean you saw me? Yeah. We saw you. We have got all of your information. So he's explaining now to Peter uh -huh, how, how the prophetic works. Okay. Uh -huh. Send therefore to Joppa uh -huh. and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon at Tanner by the seaside. We knew it wasn't, it wasn't your house. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Yes. We were told that when you come you will speak. Yes. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, mm -hmm. and thou hast well done that thou art come. Thank you. Yes. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God? Yes. Before God. <laughs> oh, my God. Not even before you. Before God. I realized that Peter, you lost it when I fell down and I worshipped. You thought I was worshipping you. Our understanding here is Gentiles. Of how God camouflages himself. We can detect him. We can smell him. No matter how he tries to hide, we can find him out. So we know here we are gathered in the presence of God. What did he say? Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Sit down. He's further prophesying that you have been commanded by God. You have an assignment to talk to us. Yes. You have been instructed yes. to talk to us. Then he was given the platform. Hmm. Then Peter opened his mouth. 
Uh-huh. And said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of, of persons. I perceive, I see, my eyes are open. You will meet a company of prophets and you will also prophesy with them. So he's, yes, Peter, before he starts ministering, now his eyes are open. It means the audience has ministered to him also. The audience. Now I can see that God, he's seeing God from a different light. He's not a respecter of persons. He thought this was just for the Jewish people. Now I can see. So he was blind yet ministering. I can perceive. He had, not, he had no comprehension of the God that had sent him until now. Now I can see, I can perceive. Uh huh. But in every nation, in every nation, he that feareth him, if there is a man there who fears God and works what? And worketh righteousness. Uh huh. He is accepted? He is accepted with him. In any nation, you have been working righteousness. Now we know that there is another person who has been talking to our God. We didn't know angels were coming also here. We thought they were our angels. The Jews. You're telling me four days ago he was here? Yes. Uh huh. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel. Now, that's Peter speaking. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel. Yes. Preaching peace by Jesus Christ. The word which God sent where? Unto the children of Israel. What was the word? Preaching, Preaching peace. And peace was preached through? By Jesus Christ. The coming of the Lord is the preaching of the message of peace. There is no peace unless Jesus is introduced. The introduction of Jesus in a nation is the introduction of peace. You must understand the product that you are going to carry to the nations. If nations will ever experience peace, it must be Jesus that they experience. It has to be Jesus. Who we'll talk? Don't worry. We are just getting to know each other. Now, read it. Read it. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, uh -huh. preaching peace yes. by Jesus Christ. Yes. He is Lord of all. He is Lord of what? All. Yes. The word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea. Throughout all Judea. And began from Galilee. It started from Galilee. But look at this. After the baptism which John preached. After, now we are drawing closer now. After the baptism which what? John preached. So apart from the baptism that John conducted, he was able also to preach it. John would preach would teach, would explain his deeds. He was able to talk about what he was doing. Remember what I said when I was studying that? You, okay, okay, you were there. You were there. It's one thing to heal the sick. It's another to talk about it in detail. Can you explain how it is done for the sake of us that have come? There's a baptism which John preached. Not just baptized with. John preached. So the baptism was in word form. Yeah. 
So he's saying since, why? Why? Why from that time? Now we, we'll get to how. Uh -huh. After the baptism which John preached, mm -hmm. verse 38. After the baptism which John preached, yes? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. This is why Peter is able to pinpoint exactly when and how Jesus, who was once of Nazareth, became the Christ. At what point there must be an event which happens in your lifetime that brings a definition of your calling. It has to be known when exactly did Jesus become the Christ? For Jesus to be anointed by God with the Holy Ghost, not with oil, but with the Holy Ghost, where God took a personality called the Holy Spirit and anointed his son with a personality called Holy Spirit. When did that happen? When he came out from the preaching and the practice of baptism of John. And the Holy Ghost, the heavens open. Huh? And the Holy Ghost came down. It's almost similar to what Peter had also seen the heavens opening and then the sheet came down and there were beds and so on and so on. It's almost, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. But that's when the Holy Ghost came and he sat on Jesus and he remained on Jesus. And that became the anointing. Of the Holy Ghost that came upon Jesus. And from that day onwards. What we began to see was the manifestation of the Christos. The anointing. How? How? Jesus got anointed the day he had submitted to even a lesser ministry, a man with a lesser calling. Him being God who invites and who sends people, he went to a man who, that he had sent and he sat under his ministry. It's up to John to think that since Jesus has come, he's smaller than me. It's up to John. It's up to John. It's up to John. You will have greater people, bigger men of God than you, come to you for solutions. God will send people into your life that you would think they are coming so that you endorse them, and yet they are coming so that you are endorsed. Be careful. We have the greatest of them all. Attending a seminar that was conducted by John. Yet John was told that he that comes after you is greater than you. Yet the one greater is amongst your audience. Is amongst your audience. He was there, Jesus came. It was at that level of humility that God anointed him. How God anointed Jesus. You might want to know how God anoints. You might want to know how God anoints. It was at the time 
when Jesus, who is the creator of everything, including the water that he's about to be immersed into, he stood right next to a man that he had created. And when you are baptized, you are handled by a man and you are lowered, not lifted. You are reduced. You are submerged under his teaching, under his gospel of baptism. He is, Jesus is not there so that you believe in him. He is there so that you believe in John. Then when he came out, you might have never had that chance in your life. But Jesus had that opportunity and he saw it as an opportunity. He knows the anointing flows only when you have gone to lower regions. That's, that's what creates the flow of water in rivers. Whenever you find the water flowing in a river, it's coming from a higher dimension, flowing towards a lower dimension. If there is no humility, there is no flow of oil. When you lower yourself under John, there is a flow of ministry from him to you. His time is over. Being under John means that you have created a flaw. Because now from that day, we are not going to hear anything significant about John. The day Jesus humbled himself. And he went and he sat and he was immersed and he was baptized he was dipped and he went under John. Now the, left, the ground is no longer level. The oil has to flow. The mandate has to be transferred. And when Jesus came out, that's when the heavens opened and the Holy Ghost came. He wasn't the dove, but in form of a dove like a dove. Be seated, please. Now, I'm showing you how, because you might want to know, before I tell you what the anointing is, we might try to get into that in our next session, because you need to know what the anointing is and how it works. But the how part is very important. Acts of humility. It happened when Jesus had subjected himself to the baptism of John and the Holy Ghost came upon him. And when the Holy Ghost came upon him, he went about doing good, but before he went about doing good, he was led by the Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted. So we'll start from there now so that you understand what is happening. The anointing, when it comes upon your life, you must begin to understand certain directions. The anointing is capable of taking you to regions where you have never been before. They are not always pleasant. The anointing that came when the anointing came upon Jesus. Hey, you need God's grace at that point because after such a display of power in the presence of people and God confirms from heaven that this is my beloved son. 
in whom I am well pleased. And from such a place the work was supposed to begin. Then from such a place he was led into dry places. After an anointing had come upon his life. This is, this is a paradox. This is not how the anointing, the anointing that we know works. We are not ready for this kind of an anointing. It has to come on me and then straight to the palace. <laughs> the anointing that came on him led him first to a barren place. There wasn't even the sick to heal. You are for a greater audience and you are taken into a barren place by the anointing. <laughs> oh, this is why you think you don't have the anointing because of where you are. That's why you think you don't have an anointing. I'm now, now I'm answering the question. Now. You <laughs> because of where it has led you. You look around you, you say, I cannot be here because of the Spirit of God. Yet the Spirit led him to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The devil. Now, the Spirit is not going to tempt you. Let not a man when he is tempted say, he is tempted of God. For God does not tempt with evil, neither does God tempt any man. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. The main part of God had to be tempted. And the one to tempt cannot be God. For God does not tempt any man. Even with evil, neither does he tempt any man. But a man is tempted when he is drawn by his own lust. So for Jesus to be tempted, there must be some kind of lust that we are supposed to talk about. That without it, you would have not been tempted. Even as you was led, though by the Spirit, into the wilderness, there was some kind of a drawing. When a man is drawn by his own lust. James 1 verse 13. Mm -hmm. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. I am tempted of God. So don't say that if you are a man. Right? Let no man say when he is what? Tempted. So during your temptation, make sure that you what? You don't, don't say. say. Is it okay? Never say that I'm tempted of God or I'm tempted by God. Don't say that. Okay? And this is the reason. Because we want to understand now. Because this all oh, this fall, falls under how God anointed Jesus of now. What begins the day you get anointed? You must have an understanding of what temptation is all about. You don't know what the anointing does. To the anointed. Some of it. You think it's a demon. That you are dealing with. Yet it is an anointing.
If it was a demon, and you say to an evil spirit in the name of Jesus, come out. It has to come out. By now, you should have been free. Yet after all forms of deliverances, you still like women. And you still think that there is another kind of prayer that you are yet to do that will set you free from the desire, from a sexual desire. We'll talk about too many, too, a lot of things here. Because you have never been taught, you've been to seminars before, you've read books. You are yet to be told that an anointing from God can perfect your desire for women. You like men more after the anointing has come upon you. Okay. All right. All right. What you need to understand is that <clears throat> I didn't say I didn't say sexual desire with your wife. I didn't say I said women. Okay. You understand it when I had said sexual desire for your wife, you would say, Yes, that's your wife. But remember when I had the desire, she wasn't my wife at that time. She was a woman. No, 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 no. You are looking at me like as if you are not. <laughs> listen, 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 listen. Hear this, hear this, hear this, hear this, hear this. You want it to be a desire for your wife only. And yet, if the desire was for your wife only, you were even never going to find a wife. She had to be a woman first that you looked at. When I looked at her whilst we were in church and she was busy praying, I was not praying. And I could see her love for God. And I desire to be like God to say, you are loved by such a beautiful <laughs> blessed are you. <laughs> How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, so let's save the scripture over here. I can explain it from here, no problem. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. This doesn't sound good. Because we're not talking of God being tempted. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted. For God cannot be tempted. Why tempted? He's not saying for God cannot tempt. He's saying for God cannot be tempted with evil. So you must learn to combine this and this. There is a man of God. And when you are being tempted, it is never the God part of you that is tempted with evil. It is the man. Now, <clears throat> now, now, now. now. 
If you tempt God with evil, he will succeed every time. So, let's not just think of God who is in heaven. I'm talking of the God in you. That one cannot be tempted with evil. But what is tempted with evil is the man. And the man is not being tempted by God. The man is tempted when he is drawn. For every man is tempted when he is drawn. Away of his own lust. Away of his own lust. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now, you will notice as we continue reading, because we want to understand how the anointing works, you will notice as we, as we go on deeper into that passage of Scripture that even lust can be at a certain point not be the sin that you are committing. Because it is the conception And what becomes of lust is sin, and what becomes of sin is death. I want you to, to look at the migration, the journey, that then when lust has, has been what? Has conceived. Now, when lust is conceived, it is what you do with the lust. Not whether you have it or you don't, because you have it. Now sit down, please. Let me, let me talk to some, some men of God and women of God here. Even the most prayerful men of God that has convinced you that there is a level of prayer and a level of tongues that you speak. If you open your eyes while he's speaking in tongues, you will see his wife sitting right next to him. Then you will know there is something else that prayer cannot handle in his life. He's telling you that if you pray, you need nine more hours. To pray out the desire for a woman. And what is sitting next to him is not a prayer. It's a woman. Okay. Gentlemen, seeing me walking in here holding her hand. It's a declaration of a weakness. I've told all of you, I cannot live without her. I need her. Not so that she prays for me. I want to sleep with her. Do I, do I have the right audience here? Okay. Okay. So put, put, put in the scripture. I want people to see. Because this is something that you're trying to deal with. You're wondering how come when you prayed and fasted for an anointing, your lust even increased. Some of you, you were even more faithful to your husband, to your wives, before you got born again. And no one has ever told you what the anointing can do. You don't understand that when a man is anointed, his perception now he has clarity. I will tell you how to deal with the anointing because it will put you at a level where you have never been before. You see people with a unique eye. You will understand beauty from an anointed perspective. Ah. No, I, say, I said we will talk, right? We will talk because you are, you are not... You, you need somebody who can tell you, my brother, what is giving you problems these days? You got the anointing. 
It is now the management of that anointing. I need to train you now on how to manage. Yeah. Then when last have conceived, so the last will have to conceive. So what the devil really wants to bring into your life is sin, but it doesn't come as sin. It comes as what? As last. At this point, you might have this and even make it to heaven. At that point. I did not send somebody to go out and search for a wife for me. And for them to come back and give me an update on how she looks and so on. I went out myself. Looked. I saw her. And apart from her spirituality, she was attractive to me. Now, depending on what I'm going to do, that is going to decide whether that was last, or it was a mere analysis. Your interpretation now, there is something about her that I liked physically. Not spiritually, physically, because it was not even the God in me that wanted to make use of those things. Okay. Okay. If I don't set you free on this one, you might never be free again. Okay. When last hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, by finishing it means completeness or perfected. When sin is now perfected, it brings death. For the wages of sin is death, but you don't just die because you've sinned immediately. It becomes death. Eventually you die because of a sin that you would have committed today, tomorrow. Even last. I know you might want to quote a scripture for me where Jesus said, it is said that you shall not commit adultery. I know you are preachers, you have that already in your mind. Jesus said you shall not commit, Jesus said it is written that you shall not commit what? But I say unto you, whosoever what? Last flu is already what? Committed what? Adultery. Let's have it so that we understand. Because I don't want to be contradicting what Jesus told you. Yes. yes. Verse 28. Mm -hmm. Verse 27. Matthew 5. Uh -huh. Ye have heard that it was said. You have heard that it was said. What you heard was what was said. Not what I'm saying today. What was said. Yeah. What you have heard is what was said. said. Who said what was said? By them of all. Not him. Because now he will tell you that I say. So there are those of all that said. And you had. Uh -huh. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Mm -hmm. But I say. But I. I. You have two people that have spoken to you. The older generation, though the older generation is claiming to have heard from me. But now I say it's me now in person. The message is arriving at your doorstep uncontaminated. Not me having sent somebody. Now you are hearing me live and direct. That's Jesus now. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her just looking at a woman to lust after her is what? Hath committed adultery with her where? already where, in where? his heart. In his heart. You have already committed adultery in your heart. Sit down. Okay. We are talking about how 
God anointed Jesus of Nazareth and what began to happen after he had the anointing. He was now the first period of his ministry was dedicated to the discovery of his lusts. That's the first thing that the anointing does. When it comes upon you, your lusts are supposed to be exposed. Your hunger is supposed to be realized. So what is he saying there? This looks, if you try to compare the two, it says if what they had had before was even easier to keep than what Jesus is saying. So explain that to me and explain grace to me over there. Would rather have the older generation talk to us than you, Jesus, coming and then you are saying, if I can only look at it, I've already done it. Where is grace now? You are complicating a testament that we think is old is even better than what he's saying now. So what is he saying? What is he saying? He's not trying to reintroduce the law. He's not trying to help you try your best. I'm, 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 trying, I'm, I'm trying to be careful here because there could be one or two people who, who are here who are not supposed to be here. <laughs> there could be. There could be, just in case. In his attempt to help you realize the importance of the law, he's at the same time wanting to let you know that you cannot do. If you want to go by the law, the actual idea that we had was for you people to never even look at a woman and last after her. Once you have done that, you have already committed adultery. So he's not telling you that so that you don't go out there and last after a woman. He's telling you that so that you understand that with the law, you can never make it. That's what he's trying to say. You're not getting what I'm saying. No, no, no. no. You're not following. He wants to show you how complicated the law is. So that you do away with the law, you say, would rather have Jesus. Because he's talking to a generation that is so obsessed with the law, wanting to keep the law at all costs. And Jesus wants to show them how difficult it is for them to even keep it. So he's not saying it so that they keep it. He's complicating the law further so that they cry for something completely new. To say, if that's the case, then I can never make it alone. I need you. So he's marketing himself by proving to you that even if you want to keep the law, you cannot keep it. Can you keep it that far that you won't even look at a woman and lust? How do you even marry the woman? You would have seen two or three or so and then you choose one. What do you do with the rest? You would have lasted. You would have committed adultery. So let's not talk of complicated things here. This thing is not practical. And when you say, no, 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 who can do that? You can. That's exactly what Jesus wanted you to think. Yeah. That's exactly, he's pushing you into that trap where you can see that you cannot do it by the law because you can't keep it. Because without committing adultery physically, you still commit adultery in your heart if you want to go by the law. So the next question would be, who is still interested in the law? That's what he was trying to achieve. Who is still interested in the law? Who can keep it? So he's trying to bring them out of the law so that they now have their confidence in what Jesus is about to provide for them. 
So back to the issue of lust. When lust is conceived, <laughs> then when lust hath conceived, mm. it bringeth forth sin. It bringeth forth sin. 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 And then when sin is perfected, there is death. But going back to the story now, you see that a man is drawn by his own lust. So when you are being tempted, it is not God tempting you, right? Neither is it the God part in you being tempted with evil. Because that part cannot be tempted with that evil. Okay. Okay. But the God in you can be tempted with something else which is not evil. There is goodness that can tempt you, that can tempt the God nature in you. Okay, you put, you put it back. No, let not any man when he is tempted, verse 18. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with what? With evil. evil. So, had they said, for God cannot tempt with evil, then we would know he's talking to, he's talking about God not tempting the man. But in this case, tempted means this God here is the part of God in you that cannot be tempted with what? With evil. But that God nature in you can still be tempted, but not with evil. You can be tempted with goodness. Okay? Yes. There can be the nature of God. At some point, you might you might do certain things that are so good in the kingdom of God, yet, yet it's your, your temptation directed towards the God in you. And you might not see any evil in that. You will pray for people that you are not supposed to pray for. You will try to heal people that are not supposed to recover. You will raise the dead that God would have killed. So that's how the God is also tempted, but not with evil. <laughs> there are people that God have allowed to go through certain financial dryness. Because a message has to be conveyed to them. And before they realize where the calamity is coming from, you come and you bail them out. You give them money before they learn It means before you help an individual, you must have an understanding of what he's going through. What could be happening to that person? It is probably something that was triggered by something that was done. And you short circuit the process of his discovery for him to realize where is this thing coming from? And then you bail him out. You come and then you give the person money. That's a relief. Yet he was almost done with the class. God was almost there with him. It's, it's like you have gone to the forest and you come across a man whose claws are coming out like an eagle. And you are not aware this is the king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar. He has lost his mind. He's being afflicted. A demon has entered into him. Be very, very careful how you conduct deliverance to such a man. Before a certain stipulated time frame. Because it was prophesied for how long is he supposed to be in that condition. Before he realizes that there is a God in heaven. And then you come and you heal the man before his time of realization. So the God in you can be tempted. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? So it's very important that you take note of this. Before it is time, before it is time, 
before it is time. You will look at a person and you feel like I, I, I just, I just, you know, I just, I just, I just feel like helping people. There are people like that. Your desire is just to help people, and you don't know why you are in trouble today. Now, let me finish this for now, and then we dismiss, and then we come back. Thank you, Master. Thank you. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man so God is never going to tempt men men are never going to be tempted by by God okay but what happens when a man is tempted but every man that is tempted how many men every man that is what that is tempted every man that is ever tempted is what when he is drawn away of his own lust he's drawn away of his own lust his desire for something he's drawn away by his desire for something. Uh huh. By his own lust and enticed. And enticed. It means baited. That's the enticement there. You are being baited like a fish. It means then whoever it is that is tempting you must have knowledge of your appetites. For him to tempt you successfully, that devil must be good at analyzing your diet, your preferences, your choices. If he cannot have access to that list, he cannot tempt you. Because your temptation has to be fabricated according to your liking, your choices. So Jesus now being led into the wilderness to be tempted. As God and also as a man. Which part of him was being tempted? God can never fail an exam. The man, the Jesus from Nazareth. Before the anointing settles well in you, you have to be taken on an errand into a place where they have a feel of your lusts, your appetite. And Jesus is taken into the wilderness and after the prayer and the fasting, he became what? Hungry. Hungry. Jesus became hungry, not because of a fast, because it was after a fast that he became hungry. It became, it was after, and afterward, he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards, not during 40 days and 40, after 40 days and 40, if you try it, you won't become hungry after 40 days. You will become hungry now, 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 now. It was after 40 days and 40 nights that what? He was in hunger. Afterward. Not during. So the hunger that came after 40 days and 40 nights was not for food. He realized his appetites. As a man, he was supposed to have lusts, not sin. But he did not fast for that to disappear. He fasted for that to manifest. You might have tried fasting and you realize that that's when you sinned. After a fast and you wonder, so why, why did I even fast? You did not know what else fasting does. These are things that were in him. Jesus had a hunger that he never knew he had. So fasting is so that the hunger is brought to the fore. So that you know what, how to deal. It's, it's like the part of hair that is yet to grow, you can't cut it. All the hairstyles that you can do, you can only work with the part that has come out. Am I right on that one? Yes. 
Yet it is there. There is a factory right under the skin where there is the creation of the hair before it manifests. So when an anointing comes upon your life, things that are hidden that you never knew that you had will have to be brought to the surface so that they are dealt with. This is why it was after a fast that Jesus hungered. He hungered for what? You know it according to scripture that there are only three things in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three areas that Adam, first Adam was what? Tempted. On that tree, it was all about what you see, pleasant to the eye, good for food, the lust of the flesh. The tree able to make one wise, the pride of life. Same applies with Jesus, the last Adam. He has to be tempted in those same three areas again. Turn the bread, the stones into bread, the stone into bread. That's the last of the flesh so that you eat. He showed him the kingdoms. He saw the kingdoms. The last of what? Yeah. Of the eyes. But if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, that's the pride of what? The pride of life. So he had to overcome in all those three. And for, for him to be tempted in those areas, he was supposed to have lasted in those areas. If, if, if. Can you overcome this as a man? The first man we got him here. Can we also get you on the same trip? And Jesus overcame. But, but, if he overcame sin, not having the lusts that we have, his victory was compromised. I don't want to believe in his victory. The Bible says that he was tempted in all ways like we are tempted. If, if, if he is tempted like we are tempted, <laughs> they must have tempted him as a man, not as God. And there must be some lusts. You cannot tell me that he never, maybe if Jesus had an opportunity to interact with a woman, he was going to propose, the, an opportunity was supposed to be created for him to be left alone without any disciple with a woman and he never proposed he did not propose if they had not given him that opportunity until today i wasn't going to believe that he was going to make it then you must be offered that same chance of interacting especially not with a with a spiritual woman a woman who has interest in that area Ah. Overcoming. When the anointing comes upon your life and then you are fasting, you will find yourself doing things and certain, certain ideas, thoughts that will fly through your mind. You start questioning yourself. Gentlemen, am I really born again? Some of you have got a, you are holy. Thank God for you. I wish I were you. But I used to wonder sometimes, how can I have such a, a, a thinking? If I'm really born, I'm, 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 I'm with Jesus. I'm born again. And billions of people right now, they still question their salvation because of what goes through their minds sometimes. They question whether they are born again or not. Some of you, thank God for you. I'm not talking about you. I'm, not, I'm just trying to help just a few. Maybe I'm just talking to myself. But this is where you have been condemned. And you can't function well because you don't have sufficient understanding as to what is happening to you. Because you don't know how the anointing is working. 
So the first thing that happens when the anointing of God comes upon your life, it's not exploits, raising the dead. No, you are taken to a place where your hunger gets exposed. So you start realizing that I have lusts. For women. And then you say, but I never heard that before I got born again. No, you heard it. You needed 40 days and 40 nights for it to manifest. To realize that you had lust which was deep-seated in you. Which only fasting can expose. So don't wonder how come it's increasing as I'm fasting. I know of men of God who were so loyal to their wives, they started womanizing after starting a ministry. Am I talking to somebody here? After starting a ministry, now he cannot control himself. When did that start? It's the how part. When he was asking God for an anointing for ministry, he didn't realize that when that oil touches you, my God, an anointing, when it comes upon your body, it enhances everything that it finds there. The anointing, when it comes upon you, it will enhance everything on you gets magnified by the anointing. Not just the power to heal the sick. No. No. Even if you hurt people, the hurt will be enhanced. The anointing will not leave out certain areas of your life. So when you say, Lord, anoint me, watch out what else God anoints. Certain things in your life that you don't like. They are also equally anointed. Try and help a poor man who is anointed. The poverty is at another level. Maybe I wasn't supposed to say this today. Maybe I was supposed to send you on emails and so on. I'm helping you know yourself. At least start knowing, okay, now I see. Now I see this is why I was having problems here. So this is going to help some of you here. If your wife is here, if your wife is not here and you're in ministry, she must have an understanding of your anointing graph. Any additional grace that God puts on you, she must have an understanding that now your desire, even for sex, is, is risen. Okay, we are just starting. I'll, I'll let you go for lunch, okay? You can go for lunch, then we'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 